Hello and welcome to the EPRS Chronicles. In this three-part series, we will be looking at climate change. More specifically, we will explore how climate change is affecting the EU and the world, and what the EU is doing to both mitigate and adapt to climate change. To delve into this topic, I'm joined by both Lisa Lotta Jensen and Henrique Simoes, both EPRS policy analysts uh, specialized in climate change. Lisa Lotte, I'm going to start with you. We are in the European Parliament today, and uh, they declared a climate emergency in 2019. So climate emergency sounds very alarming. Can we already see the effects of climate change. And uh, can you tell us a little more about how it's affecting our continent? The impacts from climate change is increased intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. Um, we have already witnessed in 2021, everybody remembers the devastating floods that hit Belgium and Germany. Last year, we saw wildfires spreading across France, Spain and Portugal. Um, now, you might say wildfires, they're quite common in southern Europe, mm -hmm. but actually we also saw in 2021, Finland experienced one of the, one of the major wildfires in their history. So it is, not, it is spreading and it is, it, their impacts are going to get worse. Uh, in Europe, 40% of the population live in coastal areas. And this is going to also mean real impacts on local communities with extreme uh, storms and flood surges resulting from these storms. And on the longer term, sea level rise um, can be expected. So we will be facing some real impacts in Europe. Can you tell us a little more about what kind of impacts uh, will um, climate change have on society? Well, the impacts vary and you might say that we have three kinds of impacts. So you have economic costs, then you have the social or human costs, and you also have environmental impacts, of course. Can you give us some examples of the economic costs? Yes, on the economy, when we have these extreme weather events, you will have a lot of damage to property and it can also impact critical infrastructure, of course. And you might even see some supply chains getting blocked due to the impacts from these uh, events. If we look at specific sectors, especially for agriculture, the heat waves and droughts that are going to increase will impact food production. So we will have a reduced food output. Um, in sectors such as energy, the logical example to choose is hydropower because we all know it needs the water. So if there's a period of drought with low water levels, that's going to be an issue for hydropower production. However, other energy uh, facilities also use water as a cooling agent, including nuclear and ther thermal plants. So we were, we're likely to also see a reduced electricity production uh, during these periods. And what about the human and social costs more specifically? Well, on the, on the human side, when we, have, when we experience extreme events, um, actually what some people might not be aware is that heat waves are some of the deadliest events. Um, we have a lot of groups that are particularly vulnerable to these events, so it can be people who are suffering from chronic uh, respiratory illnesses and, and especially also the elderly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and with the increased urbanization that we've experienced over the past decades, we also, this issue actually becomes worse because we have the so-called heat island effect in built up areas, which means that actually it gets warmer in the cities, uh, increasing the likelihood of, of fatalities. Um, also from extreme weather events and damage, as we were just talking about, you might be forced to temporarily leave your home and you will need to be received somewhere else. So we need to have the adequate services in place and the adequate insurance solutions also for that. But if you are a farmer and you live in an area that is just no longer arable, you might actually need to permanently move somewhere else in order to provide for yourself and your family. And what about the environmental costs you mentioned? Well, on the environmental side, it becomes a bit more tricky um, because we do not, we're not yet very uh, much in uh, detail monetizing um, the environment and the impacts that we might see. Uh, so it's hard to say, but for sure, changed weather patterns and change in temperature will affect ecosystems and biodiversity that is already under threat. Um, and as humans, we rely on the environment around us for our well-being and for our economy as well. Henrique, um, I'd like to um, move over to you now. Um, 
Is it likely that we will see um, such changes in our lifetime? What is the current research telling us? Well, the events that Lisa Lotta mentioned, they're already happening. And under the Paris Agreement, uh, we should aim to reach global peak emissions as soon as possible in order to keep the um, global warming below two degrees and ideally aiming for 1.5 degrees. Uh, research has shown that the world is likely to reach 1.5 degrees of warming within the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And very recently, the IPCC highlighted that the global surface temperatures will continue to increase until at least mid-century. Some changes that we see in Earth's system may become irreversible, especially changes in the ocean, ice sheets and global sea level. When you say irreversible changes, I'm assuming you mean that we are getting past the point of no return? Yes, what you're mentioning are tipping points. So in these tipping points, they refer to critical thresholds behind which a small change can lead to a large and potentially irreversible change. Can you give us some examples of tipping points? Uh, one example of tipping points could be the Greenland ice sheet, which is dependent on the height of the ice. And if it starts to melt, uh, the height will go down and that may enter an irreversible decline. Mm -hmm. And for Europe, the consequence of that would be the rising of sea levels. Mm -hmm. Important to mention is that tipping points may also have a domino effect. An example of that could be droughts leading to, to desertification or food insecurity leading to migration. And a final, a final uh, aspect of tipping points is that they can be self-reinforcing. For example, when Arctic permafrost soils melt due to global warming, they release greenhouse gases, which in turn potentiate global warming again. Lisa Lotte, um, since we're talking about global problems, um, are there any joint actions being taken by countries? And would such joint actions mitigate climate change? Well, the answer to that is, is yes and no, as we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. um, so under the Paris Agreement, which Enrique just referred to, uh, countries are submitting their nationally determined contributions, which we also call NDCs. Um, and if you look at what have been promised in these NDCs up to date, uh, you can see that we, were, we will look at a projection of reaching 2.4 degrees at the end of the century mm -hmm. with the promises that are in the plans. If you look at the policies that have actually been put in place, we're looking at 2.7. So we still have some work to do and we need to see a lot more implementation action. And that would be above desired target. So what would going above target mean? Well, it is, it is very likely that we will have an overshoot. Uh, it's what we call when we go above the targets. Um, we all hope that the overshoot will be temporary, mm -hmm. short and temporary, mm -hmm. uh, because the higher the overshoot, the higher the temperature, the worse the impacts, mm -hmm. as we were just discussing. Um, and so the good part, is, the good thing is that the awareness is picking up and also because we're seeing more and more of the impact, so we see that this thing is real. Mm -hmm. um, so awareness is picking up, and that means that action is also uh, picking up. Okay, so given the urgencies, um, are countries committed <clears throat> to act fast then? I think that there is definitely a commitment to, to act on this and, and also to try to act fast, but this is not an easy, an easy process. Um, there is a clear difference between working among 27 EU member states and then collaborating at the global level. Uh, and part of the challenges lie in the fact that, that the global north have enjoyed an economic development thanks to, well, which was linked to the emission of these carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, so during the Industrial Revolution, we emitted a lot of greenhouse gases and that has allowed us to be where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, and the Global South, a lot of the countries there are still quite poor and they are in need of a similar development. So they still need to build their economies, but we need to then take the responsibility to help them do so in a sustainable manner and to provide the finance to also help them to cope with the impacts that they are increasingly uh, experiencing from climate change. And going now from a global perspective to a European one, can you tell us a little bit about what the EU is doing to lower its own greenhouse gas emissions? The adoption uh, or, and the entry into force of the EU climate law mm -hmm. uh, was a key step in this process as it made it 
legally binding for the EU and the member states to reach climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, now, of course, we need to, uh, to make sure that we implement the legislation in the Fit for 55 package, uh, and then we will, we will see where we get to. This is going towards 2030, uh, so it's still too early to tell uh, if we're, we will be able to make the actions necessary to go to 2050 climate neutrality. Thank you very much, Lisa Latte. Thank you, Enrique. Join us in episode two, where we will delve further into the Fit for 55 package.